An old song tells us the stars at night are big and bright deep in the heart of Texas, but it isn't the stars or the thousand points of light featured in this year's presidential campaign that people are gaping at in the night skies over West Texas these days. Is it ghosts? Is it goblins? What in thunder is it? Peter Van Sant filed this Halloween night report. Deep in the Big Bend country of southwest Texas, in the high plateau where cattle far outnumber people, there exists a ghostly mystery that has confounded local residents for generations. It's a phenomenon that is, that's real. Uh, it's, it's a mystery. No one has solved it yet, right? Right, neighbor? Mm, that's right. It can't be seen by day. Only when the sun goes down and the moon glows overhead do eyes turn towards the Shinate Mountains to watch the ghost lights of Marfa, Texas. Using a special night camera, we watch this ghostly light show for more than two hours. Lights that have baffled scientists who theorize they may be caused by static electricity or some chemical reaction. The mystery has spawned folk tales of spirits wandering in the night. I'd like to think that it's a, um, an old miner with a lantern out there and someone's looking for him. A ghost, you mean? A ghost, yeah. The lights appear out of nowhere, rising from the desert floor or a mountaintop, sometimes drifting, sometimes splitting in two, always exciting whoever sees the glowing balls of light. Yeah. Hey, there's another one. There's another one. Uh, our expression was, quite simply, what the hell are those? Fritz Call first saw the lights in 1943 when he was flying at night during a military training mission. It was right on the horizon and it scared us. They're very friendly. They're not hostile lights. They don't take after you or try to create an accident or a scene of some kind. There it is again. I saw See? it. There it is right. now. There. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Everyone sees something different in the lights, and some descriptions are out of this world. You always hear how UFOs just flash and they disappear. I don't know, it just looks like UFOs. Why can't it be UFOs? There is a local legend that claims the Marfa lights are from outer space, that someone or something is searching for a downed spacecraft. But if UFOs are possibly involved, it logically follows that one question needs to be asked. Any of you think that Elvis has anything to do with this light? <laughs> no. Definitely, no. definitely. <laughs> The source of the Marfa lights has never been found, and for the people who gaze and wonder about these ghostly lights, there's one right there. It's a mystery they hope is never solved. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Marfa, Texas. As you know, Halloween is a time for make-believe scary stories, but officials in Centerville, Maryland, have decided to frighten their youngsters in the area with a real story that they say is more scary than anything that they could make up. CBS News correspondent Eric Enberg reports. Centerville, a town of 3,000 on Maryland's picturesque eastern shore, is the kind of rural community where the scourge of drugs and violence seems far away. And it's true, Centerville hasn't faced a major drug outbreak. But it worries, as most towns do. You pick up a newspaper, every day you're reading something about crack, you know, overdose. Subsequently, I said, why not a haunted crack house with a theme directed against drug abuse? Stop, police! You're under arrest! Stop! Those are local police making the drug bust. Put your hands on top of your head now! Those are also local police pretending to be drug pushers. Stand up, stand up. Ah, oh, man, a handcuff, man. Most of the action is set inside the haunted crack house, which is really an old government building where volunteers conduct audiences on guided tours. Would you care for some? See your local dealer. He will be very glad to sell it to you, and then you can be just like me. And local citizens play out the roles of villains and heroes in the struggle against drugs. In one room, a real judge pretends to be trying drug cases. Sentence of minimum 10 years without parole. There's a jail, too, and the inmates are real criminals. Drugs ain't the same. I'm, I'm 30 years old, I've been in and out of it. It's, you know, I'm tired of being locked up. There's no freedom at all. You got, you don't have no privacy. Where's the present? Because we have to hurry and go to the cycle. Mom! What? Mom, I have what? a problem with drugs. What is the In another haunted house room, parents get a not-so-subtle lesson on how they may be failing in keeping their children drug-free. Look, I don't have time. I'm late. We are late. We're trying to get them not to 
get on any kind of drugs, drinking anything. And it's just not so much students, it's parents too, because parents aren't aware what they're doing, not caring. The high school drama club provided actors for a chilling scene, an overdose. Let's <laughs> cut it out! Man, that was good stuff to you, do you want nothing? Real paramedics play themselves, and they try and fail to save the overdose victim. Clear. Town officials say the only reviews for this show that they care about are the ones from youngsters. Um, I think it's good because it gets the kids more closer to what's going on. Because a lot of campaigns just tell them to just say no. And I mean, it's a good message, but it doesn't really tell you anything. As in any scary Halloween story, Centerville's pageant has a graveyard. And the message to young people is that they are not exempt. Oh, me. Seeing grace, how sweet the sound. Rodney Miles, a local carpenter who sings the somber clothes for the crack house story, has thought a good deal about what they are trying to do here and what messages a town can send to its young people in these scary times. You don't wait till it happens. You have to prepare for it, and I think that educating the kids, preparing them before they, they're introduced to the drugs, is, is, is the best way to keep it from, you know, spreading. They make it sound so, you know, uh, alluring to kids, like it's fun, it's a, it's a game or something, but it's a game that you'll, you'll end up dead. Finally tonight, Ireland has long been the land of fairies and fairy tales, but believe it or not, it's also the home of Halloween. CBS's Ian Lee ventures deep into the countryside to find its origins. There's something spooky hidden among these hills. Yes, it's green and lush, almost heavenly, but buried here is a portal to another world, another dimension. Some call it a gate to hell. They christened it in one medieval text as Durris Ifrin Aheron. So Durris is the Irish for door, Aaron is Ireland, and Ifrin is hell. So Ireland's door or entrance unto hell. It's also the birthplace of Halloween, or as the Irish call it, Samhain. And because Samhain is the night that borders summer and winter, that's the night traditionally when the borders between this world and the other world are completely open. So it's not a place you have to die in order to access. So down we go into the bowels of the earth with steady feet and a brave heart. Wet slime covers the walls while mud greases the path. Wow, kind of has a sulfur-like smell down here too. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but for thousands of years, legend has it, this cave has been home to Ireland's fairy folk, but not of the Disney variety, and woe to anyone caught by one unprepared. You're not supposed to be out on Samhain night, but if you do have to go out, they used to dress and disguise themselves as one of these beasts or demons or monsters so they wouldn't be recognized and they wouldn't be taken back down through the cave and into the other world. And that's the reason we wear costumes on Halloween, a tradition brought to America by the Irish in the 19th century. And for Bill and Vicky from Colorado, you might say they're obsessed with the ancient holiday. I'm the queen of darkness. I come to rain darkness on everyone. <laughs> what was it like going down into the depths of hell? It felt like home. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> For the queen of darkness, I can see why. Exactly. I uh, know, it just uh, reminded me a lot of Irish history. And while the history now has an American spin with the trick-or-treating, the echoes of the past stay with us today. The customs in the States, they really have to preserve and, if you like, spread, spread and keep alive the idea of Halloween and of Samhain as well. And if you find yourself traveling through this landscape past the gates of hell, remember one thing. Bring a spare disguise. It can get pretty muddy. Ian Lee, CBS News in Uvnagat, Ireland. Halloween has not gone unnoticed at the White House, where her First Lady Betty Ford today greeted a group of young trick-or-treaters, as Susan Peterson reports. Trick-or-treat? Mrs. Ford didn't look a bit scared as she faced Dracula and his fellow spirits. Though still recuperating, the First Lady stepped into her role as official White House hostess for the first time since her operation. It was a trick to promote UNICEF, and the treat was a bag full of goodies and a quarter each for the United Nations Children's Fund. Last year, UNICEF trick-or-treaters collected over $3 million. 
An eight-year-old witch was congratulated for her birthday. Then all were invited inside for a special treat. Would you like to come in and have some punch cookies? The motley group couldn't wait to count the loot and once inside, proceeded to dump their bags on the floor of the very formal diplomatic reception room. Susan Peterson, CBS News, at the White House. Trick and treaters will be performing about the same in less lofty halls across the nation tonight, but in some northern areas, particularly hard hit by last month's unseasonal frost, there may be something missing. Jerry Bowen of WCCO-TV Minneapolis reports. The extent of the shortage is uncertain, but in the Twin Cities area at least, pumpkins have been a scarce commodity since Monday. Normally, shoppers could find 1,500 pumpkins to choose from at this suburban vegetable market. Now there are less than 100, and they are rotten. September's killer frost ruined the pumpkin crop, something last-minute shoppers discovered the hard way. I don't know what to tell my children. There are no pumpkins. And the ones, as you see, the ones here are, we're hoping maybe we can find two that we will slice together two good sides and we'll tape it together or something. How desperate is the situation? Well, in the minds of some parents, it's very desperate. What am I gonna do with that? I'm gonna paint it yellow and tell my kids it's a pumpkin and hope to God they believe me. And if I can sell them on this is a pumpkin, I know I'm a good salesman. For CBS News, this is Jerry Bowen, Minneapolis. That's the way it is, Thursday, October 31st, 1974. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. Halloween is founded on superstition, on witches that fly through the air and ghosts skulking in the sullen night. In this scientific and rational age, we know better. But then, how do you explain the ghostly gleams on Brown Mountain in North Carolina? CBS News correspondent Peter Van Sant looked for the answer. Deep in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, there's a mystery that has baffled, delighted, and frightened local residents for hundreds of years. It is an eerie feeling. Is it ever frightening? Yes, definitely. You don't, nobody knows what it is. The mystery surrounds these balls of light that frequently appear at night on Brown Mountain, where there are no roads or homes, lights first seen by pioneers in the 1700s. The person who says he saw it has a most vivid description. And he has a description about the size, the color. One says, I saw a vivid yellow. Then it says, my son and I saw it, and my son was scared to death. While scientists believe the Brown Mountain lights are the result of unusual chemical reactions or reflected light, local folklore tells a ghostlier tale of spirits roaming the mountain. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a spirit, because they done checked it out. They never found that. For now, it's a mystery lay from the wonder. No, I don't think they're ghosts, but I like to listen to the legends. I like to believe they were. Oh, there, it there it is, there it is. Using a special night camera, we believe we captured one of the darting brown mountain lights. It was visible only for a few seconds. This man didn't also really saw like the light. Lightning. It didn't look like an airplane light or a beacon. It didn't look like a car headlight. I think it was something very unusual. Scientists have long tried to pinpoint the cause of the lights. 82-year-old Winnie Biggerstaff wishes the scientists would stay away. I guess it's more fun not to know what they are because it'll still be a mystery. Just leave it as it is. The U.S. Geological Survey concluded the Brown Mountain lights were reflections from nearby trains or cars, a conclusion that raises the ire of many a mountain man. Well, I told them, I don't you believe that. I, these lights were seen forever they know anything about any car or airplane or anything. Most mountain people want the mystery of the lights to remain a mystery in hopes that future generations will look and wonder and pass along ghost stories about the eerie Brown Mountain lights. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Linville Falls, North Carolina. And that's the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather, the ghost of Bob Schieffer will be here tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Happy Halloween. This is the night you can expect all those strange things to knock at your door. Well, there is one southern town where the spirits are just as likely to answer the door. Peter Van Zant is manning our ghost post in Georgetown, South Carolina. It is a place that residents say is literally haunted by its past. 
Georgetown, South Carolina, a centuries-old community where, people say, some of the dearly departed have refused to leave, choosing instead to roam many of Georgetown's stately antebellum mansions, making this the South's only living ghost town. Practically every house in town has a ghost, but the families are so comfortable with them, they are a member of the family. For more than 100 years, guests at the Hermitage estate claim they have seen a ghost they call Alice, appearing in her old room, startling guests who have seen her in the dresser mirror. In the mirror, she was as plain as my own reflection. And I knew that somebody had come in the room. When I turned around, there was no one in the room. Ghost sightings in this spirited community go back to the late 1600s, when slaves called the ghostly forms shades. 42 Georgetown ghosts have been written about, but townspeople say there may be hundreds haunting their community. Along Georgetown's coast, residents tell of a friendly ghost called the Gray Man, whose presence is said to be a warning of stormy weather. Eileen Weaver has seen the Gray Man many times. He would look iridescent like it was misty out, and uh, like a cloud was covering him. He was there, you could see him. Georgetown fishermen talk about another ghost, one that haunts this old lighthouse and occasionally sends out a mysterious light to warn of dangerous seas. Georgetown's eerie link with the past is seen here as more a blessing than a curse. And on this moonlit night, when living ghouls and goblins go house to house, Georgetown will be celebrating its unearthly citizens in a town where every night is Halloween. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Georgetown, South Carolina. Home videotape which claims to read the minds of its viewers. Come on now. A devilishly dressed man to my left, a marvelous magician and mentalist. Of course, he is Max Maven, and good morning. Good morning. Sir. Now, it is, it, it is true that you've had a lot of interest in Houdini. Absolutely. In fact, a few years ago, I conducted a seance on Halloween, as Houdini's wife uh, actually did for several years running. Uh, we got results, which was the scary part. What uh, results could you have Curiously got? enough, we got the same results that they did. Uh, on the 10th Houdini seance that Mrs. Houdini carried out, there was a mist that descended on the, uh, on the seance area. They did it outdoors. And uh, hmm. I was always told it was rain that they'd gotten. We got a mist three years ago when we tried this, and I figured it was close to the rain they'd, they'd actually received. But then I was in informed by a Houdini expert that really we got the exact same manifestation. Incredible. Nothing more specific like send corned beef or anything? No, like nothing like that. All right. We're going to try for something more specific right well, let's now. Let's have a go at it. Normally, I stick to things that are purely psychological in nature, but for Halloween, we get a little spookier. Right. This is a crystal. You've seen crystal balls yes, before. Sir. This is a, an actual piece of a crystal ball that was melted down during the religious purges at the end of the 16th century. A piece of slag crystal. I'm right. going to, uh, if we can get this on camera, you can see that that is one strong piece of Very crystal. Tough. A lot of energy in that crystal. In addition, we make use of these two slates. This is sort of a traditional piece of uh, okay. seance material. In between the slates, we place a piece of chalk. That's for the spirits to write with. They don't do terribly well without it. Now, before the, uh, before the show started, uh, just a little while ago, I showed you this list. Yes, sir. For us, this is a, a, a set of about 50 designs, not about 50, exactly 50 designs, each one rather simple to draw. And I asked you to think of one of them. Choose one at random, not necessarily your favorite, just a random design. Now, you haven't told me what design you're thinking Absolutely of. Absolutely not. As far as I know, you haven't made a, a notation, you haven't written it down. Nothing whatsoever. So it's only in your mind. Right. We're going to try and get the spirits to take that information and write it onto the slates in between the two slates right here. I'm going to hold the crystal in my fist over the slates. Now, would you, for the first time, tell us what was the design that you had in mind? It was a dollar sign. A dollar sign. All right. So we're into, we're into money today. Watch the crystal. First, we need a, a sort of an S figure. And then we need a line going straight down the center. Holy cow. Something happened. How in the world? Come on now, Max. That's fantastic. That's uh, a dollar sign is what that is. That's a dollar sign and is, uh, well, swear to heaven, this was not planned. That's well, score one for the spirits. <laughs> one for the spirits. It takes a long time to do something like this, doesn't it? Well, I've been working with this for many years. I, as I say, normally do the, the uh, psychological type of thing we call mind reading. But for the holiday of Halloween, it's my favorite time of year. And uh, so I try to do something special. I have my costume all picked out for this evening. Which is? I'm going disguised as a normal human being. <laughs> Max Maven, wonderful. My Thanks very much for nice coming by. Here. We wrap things up on this Halloween night at, where else, a popular haunt. This one is near Los Angeles, and it's not a house that gives trick-or-treaters nightmares,
but rather, as Maria Villarreal shows us, a place for friendly spirits. What appears to be an amusement park is actually Rick Polizzi's front yard. I want a lot of spectacle and a lot of people to see it. Raising spirits here. Every night in the 10 days leading up to Halloween, four to 6,000 visitors stream into this normally quiet neighborhood to experience Boney Island. Is it scary? No, it's just really cool. The idea of a fright-free Halloween began when he took his young daughters to their first haunted house. It didn't go well. They run out screaming. Right. Not happy. No, not at all. Polizzi, a former animation producer for The Simpsons TV show, decided he could build something better. We just started upping it every year, and I guess if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. How much is your allowance for this? It usually runs between like ten and 12000 each year. And it also costs Polizzi time. He starts putting up pumpkins in July. I try to back off, but it's hard. Do you think there's a point where your wife and children will be like, enough? Oh, yeah, they did that 10 years ago. <laughs> so. With his daughters all grown up, Polizzi keeps insisting every year will be his last. Isn't that the coolest? But moments One like this always pull him back. Good job. Some have introduced their kids to us now, little babies, and that makes me feel terribly old. <laughs> and still not yet ready to hang it up. Mireya Villarreal, CBS News, Los Angeles. Finally, tonight could not be more scary. It's Halloween, there is a full moon, a pandemic, and a time change. I mean, wow. But as Lucy Kraft shows us, it could be worse. It was just before Halloween in an ordinary parking garage somewhere in Japan. Things suddenly took a turn for the terrifying. <laughs> They're banging at the windows. They're rocking the car. The zombies have arrived, and they're coming for us. It's the latest in creepy entertainment for the COVID era. For 10 blood-curdling minutes, the walking dead stalk petrified patrons in parked cars, wreaking mayhem, delivering gore galore. But it's all good, clean, and coronavirus-free fun. Vehicles disinfected to protect monsters and victims alike. A group called Kawadagasatai, which means I want to scare you, promises spine-chilling thrills from behind the windshield, said producer Kenta Iwana. COVID had shut down our regular haunted house events, but we saw drive-in movie theaters open, so why not drive-in horror shows? Halloween is a recent popular American import to Japan, but these scenes from years past seem a distant memory in 2020, with revelers being urged to stay home. The Kawadagasatai actors have customized their act for audiences stuck behind glass. Eye contact is crucial, said company owner Ayaka Imaide. It's like a lion attacking its prey, with gaping jaws and bulging eyes. Starved for amusement, Japanese are ponying up as much as $40 to scream and occasionally sob through drive-in horror shows. This student said, from the start, they got up so close to us, we freaked out. Surely the safest zombie apocalypse ever. Lucy Kraft, CBS News, Mito, Japan. Cumberland, Maryland is also handling Halloween differently tonight, and we have a report from Judd Duval. This Halloween, there's something new in Cumberland, a ban on trick-or-treating. Youngsters going door to door for candies and fruits, that's against the law here. It started with the mayor and city commissioners. We did have problems. What's uh, that? Such as razors and apples and candy, pens, people, this type thing. People really do that? Yes, they did. They did, and in the more affluent neighborhoods, which surprised us very much. Now, we don't know whether it's the older people doing it or the younger. We have no idea who's doing it. Does your reaction so far indicate that a lot more communities will be doing this next year, banning trick I would suspicion so. We were just amazed with the reaction across country. I've had calls from Los Angeles, Winnipeg, Canada. We have taped, of course, the Baltimore, Washington area. There's an editorial from uh, San Juan Star in Puerto Rico, which was forwarded to us, uh, Atlanta, New Orleans, just to mention a few. And I understand the National Safety Council also picked it up. 
In Cumberland streets this week, one finds parents preparing for the parties that churches and civic groups will sponsor to substitute for trick-or-treating. And most are happy over the new law. Ben. I'm real happy they did because they've had too much trouble. I don't have a small one. This is my grandson, but uh, they're having a block party up where he lives. Tell him your mother made you a costume. My, my, mama, my mommy made me a costume. Kids, they just uh, go out and start getting into mischief since they can't go out trick-or-treating. You don't look like a mischief maker. I was um, going to I'd say I know one that won't be out getting into mischief. He'll either be at an organized party or he'll be home. The decision has apparently brought a collective sigh of relief from mothers and fathers here and in many nearby communities which have since joined Cumberland in the ban. And if the mail coming into City Hall is any indication, people in many other states are attracted by the idea of banning what the city commissioners here have called a public nuisance. Jed Duval, CBS News, Cumberland, Maryland. Scarier words have never been said, my friend. I guess this is Sherlock Holmes. I can't use my move my head because this hat is too little. C turn around right here. What's your name? Jerry Berman. And we have all of these uh, animals dressed up. This is from uh, Halloween. When Halloween. was that? There was a Saturday. At Saturday, there was a contest in the park for the best costume pet. And uh, you got like a dog at the end of you. Yeah, Panda came in second, and she's dressed as Carmen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And who do you have here? What's your name? My name's Roshana. And who are these uh, lovely uh, uh, friends you have with you? Oh, uh, right here I have Goldie. She was at the contest as well. She's a golden angel. Uh -huh. And this is Oliver. 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 This is Carmine Miranda. <laughs> a lot of Carmen Mirandas <laughs> out here. What do we have over here? Uh, this is Zorro, otherwise known as Teddy. You know, these dogs are all killers. You can't tell, <laughs> but they are all killers. Who do we have down here? This is George, and he's a redneck cowboy. He's a redneck cowboy. What does his bandana say? Well, it's his shirt that says, <laughs> Dog food sucks. Dog food sucks. <laughs> a lot of love out here, folks. And who do we have here? These aren't dogs over. These are little angels. Bridget Kilgallen. And who are the two little babes you have with you? This is Neve, and Dara is over here. And we have Rosie, who's the beagle fly down there. This the Rosie bottom. down here has eaten 450 <laughs> dog treats since we've been out here. Watch this. Let me see if I can throw one at her. Rosie, watch this. You won the contest. There, you won the contest? Yeah. Look at that. Rosie, Rosie. Dog treats, yeah! Oh, on this Tuesday morning, a spooky morning here outside our studio in New York City. I'm Jane Clayson along with Anthony Mason today, who's in for Brian, and look who's here, Martha Stewart. The one and only Martha. The one and only with her leaf <laughs> mask. Who needs a Martha? You got your own Martha Stewart mask on this morning. Handmade out of autumn leaves. <laughs> You're carving pumpkins this morning, aren't you? Oh, yes, you are too. I am too, well. It won't be quite like yours, but we'll try. Uh, all that and uh, much more. We got some other surprises up our sleeves this morning. Yeah, there's smoke coming out of the cemetery back here. I don't know. We better watch out. <laughs> Goons and goblins everywhere. Dressing uh, up like a witch has long been a Halloween tradition, but the fact is there are real witches among us who don't have green skin or a pointy black hat. As our national correspondent John Frankel found out, followers of the Wicca religion consider Halloween a religious holiday that they liken to New Year's Eve. Cheryl Salima Masson loves dogs. Her day job is as a veterinary assistant. She is also a witch. I cast this circle. And as president of the Witches League for Public Awareness, she is on a mission to bring America's witches out of the broom closet. So mote it be. So mote it be. What we hope is that the more people that know the truth about the religion, it, it'll just be a situation, it'll be, oh, so nice, you're a witch, big deal, I'm a Christian or I'm a Jew. The Wiccan religion is based on a 20,000-year-old pagan principle that places its doctrine in a god and goddess, not Satan. It's impossible for witches to be Satanists when we do not even believe that one exists. Today, these witches are going mainstream and are out to raise awareness and money in order to build their own house of worship. And if not for the pentacles and magic wands on sale, this event could easily be mistaken for, well, any typical church fair. Mine is the power of the spoken word. In this religion, Joe White is in the minority. Of the half million witches estimated to be in the United States, only 25% are men. And yes, they call themselves witches too. A warlock is an old Scottish term. It, was an, uh, it stood for oathbreaker, someone who didn't keep their promises to the church. And, they were, and then male witches were branded warlocks. But all witches are, are witches, male and female. Joe, a full-time fireman, was raised Roman Catholic. But when he lost faith in the church's beliefs, he turned to witchcraft. 
You take some ribbing? Yeah, a little bit, but it's always good-natured ribbing. They'll, they'll wonder if I put a spell on somebody or something like that, if something had gone wrong. I said, no, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. No, not, you know, not this time. While Joe, Cheryl, and their fellow congregants enjoy the support of their Massachusetts community, other witches still struggle to fit in. The kids at school, they don't understand it. In West Haven, Connecticut, a group of witches meets weekly in the basement of a witchcraft shop called Curious Goods, opened 11 years ago by a woman who goes by the magical name of Samantha Sambina. My mother chose to pick the good witch from Bewitched and uh, named me Samantha. Every person could be a witch. Any person could be a witch. I have people come to my shop and ask me, am I a witch? And I say, I wouldn't know that. You would have to know that. How do you know? It's if you have an interest in it and you pursue it and you decide that you want to make this a way of your life, then yeah. I call upon you, awesome goddess of passion. And While Samantha doesn't mask her beliefs, she and her friends okay. are not quite ready to fly above the religious up. radar the same way the witches of Massachusetts are. The more we can be public and educate people, the more that, you know, people get information and the less trouble people have who are doing it in the small covens all over the world. And as most Americans prepare for an evening of Halloween celebrations, the witches among us will be celebrating too full of optimism and pride for their new year. Happy Samhain, everyone. <laughs> for The Early Show, John Frankel, Seekonk, Massachusetts. Wouldn't be Halloween without a spooky jack-o'-lantern, so who better to help us carve one than Martha Stewart? Good morning. Hi. Hi. <laughs> These are very unusual. And happy Halloween. Yes. Well, if you have the right tools, you can do any kind of pumpkin. And we have been finding around town, even in Connecticut at the Japanese restaurant, the most fantastic carver, uh, pumpkin carving you've ever did see. Uh, this really cute pumpkin, and it's very nice when you illuminate it from the bottom. See, there's the flashlight. You, you didn't really use... cut all the way through those No, holes. but that's, you, you know what you use? You use this melon ball scoop. And this, you can just cut right through, oops, right through the um, skin with your melon ball scoop and take out a perfect round scoop like that. And it just ah. cuts enough of the flesh away so that you can see a little illumination throughout. Or you can cut all the way through. Oh, and then here we have a pumpkin decorated with vegetables, very cute, and you can just stick in the little horns or you can make them <laughs> a little bit even more evil. And radishes up here. Yep, you have radishes, you have snow peas. Little capers and eyeballs. Yep, cute, huh? Yeah. And then this one is done with these pipe cutters. These are the greatest because these go right through, let me see if I can just take it here, right through the flesh of the pumpkin and you just turn it and pull it out, a plug comes out, and there you have the perfect hole. A Swiss cheese pumpkin. Yeah, so this is a pumpkin carving kit. It has all the tools one would need. This is to scrape out the insides, this wonderful saw to cut through the very thick pumpkins, those giant pumpkins. You have your pencil, your all, all the things you need. One of the things that everybody loved though, Jane, was the chandelier that we had on the cover of the magazine. And this, made on a little wreath, made out of twigs is so simple to construct. You have to have these little Jack B. Littles, mm -hmm. that's what they're called, Jack B. Littles, trace a circle on the top where you're going to cut. It's always better to use a little bit of a pencil or a pen just so that you have some sort of little outline. And okay. then cut with your little saw. You can cut all the way around there. All right. Don't um, take out the fillings because the candles, and these are the little candles you just buy at the supermarket. You just <laughs> put them right in there and wire these to the wreath. Should to I be wire, able to cut this? Oh, you should be able to, yeah, saw a little bit. Here, 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 here. Let's see. <laughs> What's going on here? I don't know. What's going on? Oh, this is very hard. This <laughs> is very hard. We'll cut through see, like it's this. it's not just me. Uh, no, it's not just you. <laughs> but let's see. Let's make a hole okay. first with our awl. These are very hard, very little Jack B. Littles. There. Now you can use this and cut. Ah, there, there, okay. There. There's always a way. Now, use your awl to make two little holes in the bottom of the pumpkin. And then you take oh, a piece of wire. You can buy regular wire at the um, hardware store, or you can buy floral wire like this, and take this up through the pumpkin. 
This is hard work, Martha. Oh, it is not hard work. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. Just say, oh, how easy. Uh-huh. But if you want a beautiful chandelier for your Thanksgiving table, and then wire these to the wreaths. Here, you can, you don't want to do that? You don't want to finish? <laughs> it's hard. Once it will they're take wired, a while. I'll do then, it after. then use your bittersweet or any other kinds of red berries. You can get winter berries. And then just put this through your wreath here and decorate. Did light, you say that you glued light these the candles? On? No, no, you wired them oh, on. Oh, you wired them wires. on. That's what you and were doing while I was busy. it looks like when it's hung. Look okay. how pretty. I think that's in a that very, is very appealing. nice. And if we didn't have all this wind out here, right on Fifth <laughs> Avenue, we could light the candles. But here's, oh, this is, I think, the best invention of them all. If you want your pumpkin to last year after year after year, get one of these funkins. Look, it's the artificial. Classic? Yes. Oh. And it looks so absolutely real. It's a little late to find those now, but we put stained glass. You can see that there's paper inserted with little pins right into the fun kit. It's made out of a plastic material that will last you. Put it in your attic, you have it for next year. And that won't it's sour. the greatest thing. And these are wonderful. If you're worried about fire prevention, just get these little long lasting flashlights. They illuminate the pumpkins without the uh, need of, of candles. They're especially nice in a windy place or outdoors when you're worried about a little bit too much flame. Great ideas, I love that. These Doesn't are all spoil. great. And, and how do you like Pet Crow? <laughs> Pet Crow is with Very us all for nice. the entire, Very or is he a nice. raven? I think he might be a raven. What are you going as tonight, Martha? What's your costume? Oh. You know, I have not decided yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. You maybe, have all day. maybe Spider Lady again. <laughs> More whatever. Halloween surprises when we come back, Martha. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you like my hat? I, my broom is stored. But uh, <laughs> if you want to do something special before you take the kids trick or treating, our friend Freddie Greenberg, the editor in chief of Nick Jr. Magazine, has some ideas for creepy Halloween crafts. Freddie, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Oh, this is fun. This is such a fun time of year. It isn't is it? really. It's a great time for kids. You know, a lot of times parents are so busy they don't have time or they don't make the time to spend right. with their children. Why is that so important, though? Kids really look to parents for security and to feel safe and crafts and doing things together is a great way to feed that need that all kids have. Yeah, and, and this is a really easy time it's, to experiment. It's really easy, you know, you can't, and the best thing about crafts is you can't really do it wrong. There's right. no right way to do it, and that's a great thing for kids. Well, what do we have? So we have to start off with, um, another reason kids love Halloween is because it's a great way to sort of play out their fantasies <laughs> and talk about fantasies. Look at these lovely, goofy, gloppy green eyes uh -huh. that we made out of rice. Would you like one? Check it out. Um, we made these out of Rice Krispie Treats, and then you can you just glue on an M&M or any kind of a candy, and then I have my, my uh, I hope this works, um, the bloodshot material that you can just squirt on. And of this course, is just icing. This, this is, is just cake icing, icing, cake icing, right. get it in any color, um, and they get beautifully gross, I would say. Right, it's a little cold out here, but this it is. is what it looks like. This is what it, it looks like, like when right. it's done, and these are great for parties, Okay. Um, and kids love them. All right, what else? This is a neat this thing. This is a great thing. This is a candy bag. Basket, which we made you don't you scoop out the inside of the pumpkin but then kids can just apply a face and we um, made a nice delicious looking face on the front this is a great thing because it builds kids confidence to be able to do something that everybody in the family will see you can use it for a party a centerpiece tonight it's very easy to do right and you and attach, it with attach, the hot attach glue gun. everything with a hot glue gun it's very very easy to do do you want to try this well no but word um, of caution with children and with a hot children glue gun. hot glue gun not for kids this yes. is for grown-ups only right. and with any sharp tools at Halloween, make sure they stay out of kids' hands. Yes, absolutely. All right, moving along. Then we, got we have else. our rat cat bat tree, another great way to sort of decorate the table tonight or if you're having a Halloween party. What's fun about this, and I think Hannah's making yeah. some over here. Do you want to go Can over we and go, see? Let's go over sure. and take a look at the we'll one that Hannah's doing. Hey, Hannah, how's your rat cat bat tree going? Yeah, this is Theo. Theo made this really oh, super that cool is cat. fantastic. Hey, Theo, you know what? He's five. You know, Theo, I think maybe we should let it dry a little bit before <laughs> I'm, I'm sure making a mess, but Theo's mother will love how that jacket looks. Hey, What's Theo, really ones great did you about make this on here? These are cool. is that little ones can do this. It's great for small motor skill building, and they can cut them out themselves. You can even use Halloween cookie cutters to cut the rat cat bat shapes, and then they can just go crazy with glitter and glue and crayons decorating them. What, what and is this, this is just a scooped out pumpkin. Um, there's some uh, 
uh, craft foam inside and branches stuck in. You, that you'd like get easy. out of your yard or Absolutely. something? Absolutely. Okay. You can just go do a little trip in the backyard. So okay. it's an amazing thing. You know and what we, I think is good, important with kids too when they're doing creative things is don't tell them how to do it. You know, just let them go wild. That's the you best know? part like, that it's like Theo everyone can do here. it their own way. And I like the little bit of glue in his hair. It's yeah. Sort of yeah. yeah. It's the Halloween look, don't you think? All right. Well, we've got a couple we have more to one get more to. little thing to do. Oh, look at all back here. Everybody should yell trick or treat right here. Okay. We All have right. one more yes. terrific craft, and this is something that kids, little kids can do and big kids can do. Job. We created this Beulah Witch pumpkin, and it's so easy to do. You take a big pumpkin and one of these minis, you just get some black netting like this, right. and you, you, a grown-up uses a skewer. You can use a wooden skewer, and then it just sticks on top. You get this great, crazy, witchy effect, and then you can drape around the, the black cape. And then these little things are little place settings. So if you want to have a really fancy Halloween, Halloween dinner, everybody makes their own little mini pumpkin witch with a little black hat out of black construction paper. Kids can decorate them. And you can really even recycle this at Thanksgiving with a pilgrim hat. Right. These would be great for little, like, play settings. Exactly. Or whatever. You were having a party, a party or something. Yep. Yes. Yep. Well, wonderful. All right. Well, Freddie Greenberg, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I love to see you. Great ideas and stuff for everybody, all age groups. Right? More ideas at Nick Jr. Magazine. All right. Thank Thanks you very much. As any Peanuts fan will tell you, this is the night the Great Pumpkin rises from the pumpkin, pumpkin patch. Well, while we're waiting for that, we have some other Great Pumpkins to show you, but they're not rising without a crane. Here's Steve Hartman's Assignment America. 406.5 pounds. Call them gourds gone wild. 924 pounds. 1,065 pounds. Pumpkins of prodigious size. Grown by gardeners who freely admit it's not just a hobby, it's more like an obsession. It has the genetics to go heavy. And once a year, the growers gather to see whose harvest is heaviest. Straight ahead, the orange one. They're all orange. Oh, the oranger one. Steve Connolly calls his the beast from the east. And like any proud parent, is happy to share baby pictures. About the size of um, a pea. What a cutie. Yeah, wasn't she cute? That was taken July 1st. It was growing 45 pounds a day. So this thing was putting on 45, 45 pounds a day? Pounds. It would shape shift on you. You leave it in the morning, you come back, and there'd be a new shoulder sticking out here. Wow. Which was just fine with Connolly. His beast is one of about 50 entries at this annual giant pumpkin weigh off, where size is all that matters. 1,271 pounds. Thanks to improved breeding and feeding, over the last few years, giant pumpkins have gotten so gigantic. These days, a thousand pounder is just a throwaway. But it's what's inside that counts. Yeah. Every one of these pedigreed pumpkins is grown from seeds of former heavyweights. We know what seeds they're from, the grandma, the grandfather, the great grandma, the great grandfather. And champion seeds can fetch a pretty penny. Joe Jutris sold some for. It was $240 per seed. Per seed? Yes, per seed. Jutris is the giant pumpkin world record holder. 1,689 pounds last year. I can't believe this is really happening. A record Steve Connolly was hoping to break. Of course, first he had to get the beast to the ball, which was no easy task. Who would like to see Steve break the world record? <laughs> Unfortunately, in the end, 1,568.5 The beast was a bit slimmer than she looked, a mere 1,568 pounds. Enough for this year's record, but not good enough for Guinness. Let's give Steve a big round of applause. I'll take it. So it's back to the drawing board for Connolly, planning next year's plant. You'd go down in pumpkin history if you came up with the first one-ton pumpkin. I would be immortalized. I could die easy. As for the beast from the east, she's been battered and squashed. But look for her daughters next season. To give you an idea of where all this is headed, in 1976, the record was 400 pounds. Extrapolate that rate of growth, and by the end of the century, Katie, there will be a planet pumpkin. They're just unbelievable. They're and what do they do with the meat from all those big boys? It's not any good. No? You get rid of that, yeah. You don't want to make a pie out of it or okay. anything. Okay, all right. Just for the thrill of, of right. the size. And they spend four hours a day working on those crazy things. Wow. With us here this morning, Hall Kern and talk about the great pumpkin. Whoa, wow. got it here. All 816 pounds of it. Wow. Quite a pumpkin. You're going to end up in the Guinness Book of Records, not only for 
for what? Owning the world's for biggest pumpkin? Paying the most amount of money for one vegetable. <laughs> how, how much did you end up paying? Seven thousand five hundred dollars. <laughs> it's a little good steep. business it's a investment. a lot of money. Oh, sure. Right. Mm. And a lot of fun. What is this uh, pumpkin to look like this time tomorrow? Well, this afternoon we're going to take the pumpkin to the Ronald McDonald House for Children in Washington, D.C., and carve it into the world's largest jack o' lantern. Now, the seeds from this pumpkin, though, you're going to give back to the to people the, who grew it in the first place? In to New Jersey? Robert and Edward uh, Kanzars. Uh huh. Wrightstown, New Jersey. In Wrightstown, New Jersey. Right. And what kind of a business that you have that you ended up going out and paying this much money for this? Well, the Reston Farm Market's Fort Pumpkin, ah. where we sell pumpkins to children. and Certainly gets lots of attention. Are you getting a lot of attention? A lot of attention. <laughs> I would fun. suspect so. Well, nice to have you with us this morning. Yeah, thanks. Congratulations. It's great. How many pies do you think this would make? 816. Hey. How many bowls of soup? Bowls of soup? Well... Uh, I know it makes ah. 9,214 muffins. Oh, well, there you well, go. Okay. Right. Now we know right. for sure. About 1,600 oh. bowls of soup. Thanks so much. It is, of course, All Hallows Eve, the night devoted to ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties. And how does this holiday affect our usually sedate population? Linda Tyra knows. Some earthier celebrations, a 60s costume parade in Key West, and pets dressed up in Chicago. In the nation's capital, a couple dressed up and looking very much like Tipper and Al Gore greeted youngsters at the vice president's house, and some very frightening words were heard. Did you guys get some goo-goo clusters? In many cities, the biggest kids seemed the most enthusiastic preparing for this day. A mass murderer side, something, uh, you know, psychotic. I mean, yes, that would be fun. I'm actually thinking about going uh, as Don King. Uh, there we go. Now you got it. Among the most popular costumes, politically correct ones like those of the president and first lady, and a few that might not be so correct. Beavis and Butthead masks are basically being bought by, by kids and adults, you know, up to, from 9 to 50. Um, the Howard Stern wig is really popular. What happens in the news or a hot movie or, or even a hot toy has a dramatic impact. So it's no surprise that among the littlest ones, Baby Bop and Barney and Aladdin are all hot this year. Americans spend a billion dollars a year celebrating Halloween, whether it's for ghastly diversions like this, or for the chance to simply let the spirit move them and enjoy one of childhood's greatest treats. Linda Tyra, CBS News, New York. New Orleans is a good place to die. The rhythm of the saints lift the souls of the bereaved and the deceased are laid to rest not in cemeteries, but in what they call cities of the dead. You could easily have 2,400 burials in this tomb. Tourists love them because you just don't see anything like this back home. Graveyards filled with above-ground tombs and crypts. Above ground because if you bury a casket in soggy old New Orleans, it'll pop right out of the earth after a few heavy rains. I just do what my mama used to do, man. Glenn Morgan and his uncle Horace Ferrier are preparing for the day after Halloween. Do housekeeping in preparation for All Saints Day and then come out and visit uh, on All Saints Day, bring the flowers in and, and reflect on your family traditions and history. All over the city, the cemeteries are alive with folks cleaning, scrubbing, tending the family tombs. Bring you back in touch with the family. The tombs tell a story of a city where family and tradition are held in high regard. So how many people are buried in here all together? This particular tomb has 17 people in it. Alvin Jones' family tomb dates back to the Civil War. Could be my house one day. <laughs> <laughs> Got to take care of it. <laughs> like New Orleans itself, the cemeteries combine an air of welcome decay and the deliberately outrageous. Some of these people, it seems, wanted to leave the impression that you can take it with you. With special permission and a special night lens for our camera, we visited one cemetery after dark with guide and cemetery historian Robert Florence. What uh, cemetery are we in now? This is Lafayette Cemetery Number 1. Is this supposed to be haunted at all? Uh, they're all supposed to be haunted. The New Orleans-based novelist Anne Rice lives just a couple of blocks from here. Her scary books always sell in the millions, and her most popular character, the vampire Lestat, apparently 
lives here or is dead in there. Thankfully, the undead did not appear. Of course, we didn't stay around too long either. Harry Smith, CBS News, New Orleans. Well, it's here again, that day when we often turn to thoughts of things that go bump in the night. Turns out a certain house in the nation's capital is not immune to ghostly speculation, as we learned from our resident ghostbuster, Bill Plant. For two centuries now, this big house at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue has not been a place for the faint of heart. The wife of one president and the mother of another, Abigail Adams, is said to frequent the East Room, where she often dried her laundry, with arms outstretched as though carrying a fresh load of clothing. <laughs> and there have been reports of wild laughter heard round the bed where Andrew Jackson slept and where Old Hickory was involved in a famous scandal. President Thomas Jefferson used the Yellow Room to relax and play the violin. And 20 years after his death, First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln said to a friend, my, how that Mr. Jefferson does play the violin. But it's Abraham Lincoln's ghost that's most often been reported here. 40 years after Lincoln's assassination, Theodore Roosevelt claimed that he had seen Lincoln at various places around the White House. In 1945, President Truman, all alone in the White House, was awakened by three knocks on his bedroom door, followed by footsteps. I jumped up and looked, and no one was there, he said. And he added, damn place is haunted, sure as shooting. First Lady Hillary Clinton admits that it can be a little creepy walking through the White House late at night. She said you just feel like you're summoning up the spirits of all the people who have lived there. So do the Clintons believe the house is haunted? We spooked a typical non-answer from the White House spokesman. There are people who seriously believe like you? that there is a haunted quality, a haunting quality to the White House. Bill Plant, CBS News, the White House.